Konami often makes mistakes with card design, which is why the Forbidden Limited list exists in the first place. However, sometimes they attempt to fix these cards by changing how they work instead of limiting how players use it, for the better or for the worse. And in this video, we're going over some of Konami's worst attempts at eroding cards to balance them out. Starting us off at number 10, we have Treeborn Frog. This is a level 1 water aqua monster with 100 attack and defense. Its original effect says that during your standby phase, if this card is in your graveyard and you don't control a Treeborn Frog or any spell or trap cards, it can special summon itself. Treeborn Frog was a very good card for monarch-centered strategies back in the day. Being able to get tribute fodder every single turn for no cost was something no other card could do. And as duels took away more turns back then, you'd be able to trigger a Treeborn a dozen times in the same duel and have it provide value every turn. Another one of Treeborn's great attributes was how versatile it could be, as its revival effect was not once per turn. This meant that if you can get it off the field during the standby phase, you'd be able to bring it out again. You could use this interaction to do things like an enemy controller to trigger the Treeborn to steal an opponent's monster and then get your frog again afterwards. The way this card was eroded was that its revival effect became a soft once per turn. This didn't interfere with the combos such as the Econ one, as that card is treated as another copy when it leaves the graveyard, but it made this card lose some key interactions. For example, when facing a Light and Darkness Dragon who can negate effects at the cost of 500 attack and defense, you could repeatedly trigger Treeborn in the graveyard to drain Light and Darkness Dragon's negates all at once. For a more modern example, say if Appaloosa negates your Treeborn in the graveyard, you'd be able to attempt to bring it back again. This errata made it so that you could no longer do this for both situations, as you'd only be able to trigger each unique copy of Treeborn in the graveyard once. This is just the first of the many unwarranted erratas in this list, and even if they did randomly nerf a card that hasn't been relevant in forever with it, at least it was only a slight hit. And now at number 9, we have Toon World. This continuous spell currently only has an activation condition, which says you must pay 1000 life points to activate this card. Despite not really having an effect, Toon World has managed to see play a couple of times throughout the years. Even if Toons as a whole have never been a competitive strategy, the existence of Toon Table of Contents, a universal searcher for the archetype, which can also search itself, boosts the playability of almost every one of these cards. Most commonly, this one was used in FDK decks played alongside Royal Magical Library, which can draw you cards if you activate multiple spells in the same turn. Toon World has some nice synergy in these decks, since it can be bounced back to the hand with Giant Trune to get another spell activation, and it also lowers your life points, which helps for FDKs that use Reversal Quiz or Life Equalizer. One thing most people don't know is that Toon World has actually received an errata before it was released in the West. In the original OCG printing, on top of requiring 1000 life points to be activated, you'd also have to pay an additional 500 life points during each of your standby phases or else it'd be destroyed. But if it left the field, you'd get all the life points you paid for its maintenance costs back. This errata did buff the card by a small bit, but it does raise the question of why would Konami cut out most of this card's effects like this. It's not like this buff was going to make Toons anywhere near playable at the time. Though it's not like they'd ever end up doing that, since Toon Kingdom haven't managed to do so despite being one of the most overtuned pieces of legacy support out there. The reason why they changed it is unknown, but it can probably be brushed up as to an oddity from the really early Yu-Gi-Oh years where countless erratas had to be thrown around, though this seems to be one of the less justifiable ones. And at number 8 we have Brain Control. This is a normal spell card which lets you pay Android life points to target a face that monster your opponent controls that can be a normal summoner set and take control of it until the end phase. In its original state, this card could target anything instead of just normal summonable monsters, making it into what's essentially a change of heart with a slight downside. For that reason, it was very quickly limited after its release, as it was too strong for the metagame back then. This card and mind control both became must-have staples when the Synchro Era started, as you now had way more ways of getting rid of stolen monsters by using it as a material. These two were in most decks that had any tuner access, though Brain Control was clearly the superior one, as Mind Control still stopped the monster from attacking or being tributed over, and that's why Brain was the one that ended up being banned. This card remained on the Forbidden List until 2017, when it finally got an errata that made the card completely unplayable. Brain Control would have still been a decent card with its new effect back in 2009, when you were still taking main deck monsters with it anyway, but the same didn't fly for the modern era. Not being able to take extra deck monsters meant that often you wouldn't be able to take anything out of your opponent's board as that's what's pretty much every deck ended on. On the flip side, Mind Control, which is still out at 1 and didn't get an errata, had its restrictions matter less and less with time because of how less the battle phase mattered and how easily you could use your opponent's monster as a material. By this point, you could either synchro or exceed with whatever you took, and this would only become easier with the introduction of Link Monsters, making it so that pretty much every deck had a way to get rid of monsters on their side of the field. This made Mind Control a staple throughout all of the Link era, and it was even allowed at 3 copies for quite a few formats put into question how necessary it was to kill brain control like that, as it's only slightly better than mind control. This question was finally put to rest when they freed Change of Heart itself, the stronger version of both of these cards, earlier in 2022, and it doesn't even see that much play now. 
The issue with this errata is how it completely killed off the card for good, as it became 100% inferior to every other option then, when power creep would have made it fine to have it at 1 in a few years anyway. And at number 7, we have Chaos Emperor Dragon and Voy of the End. This is a level 8 Dark Dragon monster with 3000 attack and 2500 defense, which must be special summoned by banishing a light and dark monster from your graveyard. It has the effect to pay 1000 life points to send all cards in both players' hands and on the field to the graveyard, and then burn your opponent for 300 points of damage for each card sent this way. pre errata Chaos Emperor Dragon was one of the best monsters in the game when it came out. Its summoning condition, a staple in pretty much all Chaos monsters for the time, made it easy to bring out as most good monsters around were light or dark. Its effect to wipe the field made for a deadly combo when used with Sangan, that could be used to search out Yadagarasu to leave your opponent with zero cards and without a draw phase. This is one of the most iconic cards in Yu-Gi-Oh's history, as its printing forced Konami to change the limited list to the forbidden and limited list. This is why it's such a shame that I got an errata that made it an entirely different card than it once was. The new version of Chaos Ember Dragon has the same effect as the original one, but you cannot activate any other card effect the turn you use it. This checks for activating cards before as well as after Chaos Emperor Dragon comes down, meaning that if you want to use this, it must be the only thing you're doing on your turn. Functional erratas like this have always been a point of contention throughout the community, as what's the point of changing a card to unban it if it's effectively not the same card anymore? Players generally enjoy it when old powerhouses are brought back in a somewhat playable capacity. This has happened multiple times with things like Sangin seen play as recently as last year, or Ring of Destruction being playable in burn strategies. Chaos Emperor Dragon definitely won't ever be able to come back into the game with its old effect, but when it comes to dealing with such an iconic card, it'd be better to either print a new card that attempts to bounce its old effect, such as a Pot of Greed and Pot of Desires, or to just accept it's going to be a permanent fixture on the list, like Graceful Charity. The new CED printing only serves to waste the cardboard it's been printed on. And at number 6, we have Knight Assailant. This is a level 3 Dark Fiend flip monster with meager stats that has the effect to pop a monster your opponent controls when it's flipped face up. Additionally, if it's sent from the hand to the graveyard, it lets you target another flip monster in your graveyard and add it to your hand. And with this card's newest errata, you have to add a flip monster that is not Knight Assailant instead. The subtle change in wording has to do with how its old effect would play out when you had multiple copies of this card in rotation. With its past effect, if you discarded Knight of the Sand for something like Raigeki Break while you had another one in the graveyard already, you'd be able to target the other one and add it back to your hand. This gave you infinite discard fodder while you had a little loop going on, thus giving Knight of Salem to place in the meta back then as a man-eater bug with an extra upside. The card saw play as an advantage engine for decks which played discard traps back then, up until it got limited to 1 to prevent said loop, and it remained playable anyways as a way to recycle good flip effect monsters like Daikoichi for a few years before being naturally phased out of the meta as flip effects became too slow. In 2022, Assailant got an errata and was then allowed to come back to 3. The issue at hand is that Assailant would have been already unplayable at 3 with its old text. This kind of advantage engine has been far too slow to do anything since forever. The only utility they'd have is a 2 card combo for infinite discard fodder, which there aren't really any good outlets for anyway. Sure, you can use Snipe Hunter to pop your opponent's whole board or Cold Enchanters for OTKs, but those would hardly be relevant in 2015, much less now. In the end, what this errata did was slightly nerf the card in Speed Duels, an alternate format with a much lower power level and limited card pool who had just received it. And at number 5, we have Sinister Serpent. This is a level 1 water reptile monster which originally read that during your standby phase, if it's in your graveyard, you can add it back to your hand for free. In its errata form, this card's effect not only became a hard once per turn, but it also makes you banish a Sinister Serpent from your graveyard during your opponent's next end phase. This card used to be one of the hugest staples of old Yu-Gi-Oh! Once it got into rotation, Sinister Serpent gave you value for the rest of the game in the form of easy plus ones during each of your standby phases. While it's not as impactful as a plus one as something like a Pot of Greed since you're only getting this weak monster back, it was still strong enough to be in a lot of decks. Its main application being letting you use cards which discarded for free. There were lots of great forms of removal locked behind discard costs back then, such as Raigeki Break and Phoenix Wing Wind Blast, and also cards that comboed well with the extra fodder, such as Graceful Charity and Mirage of Nightmare. This kind of resource generation from the graveyard was something that wouldn't be seen in any other card all the way until Treeborn Frog, and that's why this card got banned alongside a lot of other staples in 2005. Around 10 years later, this card would get errata before being brought back into the game, and to no one's surprise, it never saw play again. 2015 was the time where the game started speeding up massively, where we got combo behemoths like Pepe. Even outside of that, control decks now had access to much better resource loops within their own engines, like Seer and Dante. This card not only had no niche, it was also massively nerfed. And just like most of the entries in this list, it saw no play after being changed. And at number 4, we have Mermel Abyssus. This is a level 7 water aqua monster with the effect to special summon itself from your hand at the cost of discarding one other water monster to the graveyard. If it's summoned this way, you add a level 4 lower Mermel monster from your deck to your hand. Abyssus has always been the best high level monster from the archetype. 
it has the easiest summon condition out of all of them, requiring just a single discard. It's important to note that this kind of cost is a huge boon for its deck though, since the Atlanteans all have amazing effects when pitched for the cost of a water monster's effect, with heavy infantry and marksmen giving you removal and dragoons giving you a search. When brought out, it also searches for the deck's other best normal summons in Mermel Abyspike. It did so much for the deck it even came out already limited when it got imported into the OCG, where they wouldn't free it until years after Mermel's dominance on the meta was up. This card would end up receiving an errata while Mermel's weren't doing much of anything in 2017. It just changed how the effect to search when summoned worked. Before it read, you can add, making it optional, and now it's obligatory. This was a very unusual change which was quietly rolled out without much fanfare. In practice, what it did was that it made it so that you wouldn't be able to chain block Tiz's effect. In Yu-Gi-Oh, you first build the chain for obligatory effects, and then for the optional ones. And since the Atlanteans are all obligatory, this meant you could choose the order of the chain to protect Abyssus. This change essentially made it so that whenever you pitched an Atlantean for this card, the Atlantean's effect would be chain link 1, and Abyssus on summons effect would need to be chain link 2. This wouldn't have been nearly as relevant back when it first came out, but in the more modern game, that meant you couldn't build the chain to protect Abyssus from hand traps such as Ghost Ogre and Ash Blossom, making this errata into a nerf, even if it wasn't a big one. People were initially confused by this change, as the deck hadn't done anything despite having received legacy support not long before, and many wondered if it was a preventative measure for some more future support, though that never came to be. And at number 3, we have Armory Arm. This is a level 4 light machine synchro with generic materials, which works like a union monster. In that, once per turn, you can equip this card to another monster or special summon from the spell and trap card zone in attack position. While it's equipped by this effect, the monster gains 1000 attack. And if it destroys a monster by battle and sends it to the graveyard, you inflict damage to your opponent equal to the destroyed monster's attack. Armory Arm was one of the best generic synchros around back when it was still the newest summoning mechanic. This was in part due to being the only level 4 synchro at the time but it was also amazing at enabling OTKs. The extra damage could often be the difference between ending the game or not, but there was also a very popular OTK build around this card. By summoning both Colossal Fighter and Armory Armor in the same turn, you can use Armory Arm to equip itself to an opponent's monster with more than 1800 attack, and then crash Colossal into it. Since Armory Arm doesn't specify you have to be the one beating over an opponent's monster, it'll burn your opponent for 2800 when you crash into it, and then Colossal can special summon itself back from the graveyard since it's just been destroyed by battle, allowing you to crash it again. Repeat this a couple more times, and you can deplete your opponent's life points with just these two cards. This interaction was used as a payoff for many synchro combo decks for that time, such as Fish OTK, and though it wasn't something every deck could do, it was definitely a strategy you needed to be prepared for. That is, until Konami eroded Armory Arm a couple years after its initial release, making it so that its effect would now check the destroyed monster's attack in the graveyard, making it not work with Colossal since it comes back and breaking up the OTK entirely. This errata was probably done as a way to unify how the card worked between the TCG and the OCG, since in Japan, the card had slightly different wording, and so it was ruled there that the OTK wouldn't actually work. Still, the weird part about the Serata is that when 2022 came around and an Armory Arm got a reprint in the West, it had gotten its original effect back, making the OTK possible yet again. This is possibly the only instance of an errata being reverted, and stealthily at that. As it's not like there was any announcement about it, Konami simply updated the database with its newer text and called it a day. And at number 2, we have Goyo Guardian. This is a level 6 synchro monster, which takes an earth tuner plus one or more non-tuner monsters, and has 2800 attack. Whenever it destroys a monster by battle and sends it to the graveyard, you can special summon that monster to your side of the field in defense position. Goyo was one of, if not the most powerful synchro back when the mechanic was still fresh out of the oven. With a gargantuan attack stat of 2800, Eclipse not only all other synchros of its level, it also beat many of the higher level ones as well. Not only is this a huge threat, it also snowballed extremely quickly as it's still in effect turns every successful battle from a plus one into a plus two. It's important to note that before its errata, this card had no restriction on its summoning materials, and also that level six synchros were really easily accessible. This card, together with Brionic, gave you tools to deal with almost everything that could be thrown at you. It made decks with easier access to level six synchros like Black Wings a considerable force within the metagame. Similarly to Brio, this card spent a long time limited before being banned due to how much they invalidated the rest of the available synchro pool. The thing is that Brio proved to be much stronger than Goyo in the long run. Battle-related effects fell off extremely quickly, while Brio's ability to bounce cards only got more applications with time. This led to Goyo eventually being freed somewhat around 2014, and though it still saw some play in decks like Shadows, it wasn't really that big of a deal anymore. That is, according to the eyes of the TCG. In the OCG, this card remained banned all the way until 2017, where they finally allowed it to come back, but only with its errata to its materials, which made it require an Earth Tuner. To the eyes of the West, this was completely unnecessary, as the card had fallen out naturally a long time ago. To put things into perspective, the TCG got this change a month after Zodiac Dryden was released, the power level disparity between these two cards being such that Dryden is still banned to this day. 
It isn't clear if the LCG really feared this card, or if they just held a grudge from back when it dominated the metagame. But this is definitely one of the most unwarranted nerfs to a monster out there. And finally, at number one, we have Imperial Order. This is a continuous trap card, which reads, pre errata, negate all spell effects on the field. During your standby phase, pay 7 your life points or destroy this card. Imperial Order got banned really early on in Yu-Gi-Oh!'s lifespan, finding itself a place on the Forbidden List all the way back in 2004, for a really obvious reason too. This card allowed you to lock your opponent out of spells entirely for a few turns, which has always been game winning, and when you wanted to use your spells yourself, you could just choose to not pay the maintenance cost and it would destroy itself. It took over 10 years, but eventually Konami thought this card would be fine to be brought back into the game with one small change. They changed it so the 700 life point payment was no longer optional and also was done during both players' turns meaning you couldn't get rid of your own IO as easily as before. While this did lower the power of the card slightly, it was still one of the most powerful floodgates in the history of the game. Overnight, this card became a staple in pretty much every side deck as one of the best going first options you could have. Spell cards play a vital role in pretty much every single deck, often being consistency pieces, utility, and removal. If you go first and have IO, you can use all your spells that you desire on your turn, and then when your opponent tries to use them to deal with your board, you flip over IO and lock them out of the game. Locking yourself out of spells for the next turn doesn't matter if you're so far ahead that your opponent can't possibly come back into the fray. It didn't help that many decks could easily deal with their IO if they still needed to use spells, like Zudiant and Dryden to pop their own. This one of and many side decks helped turn many Yuga matches into non-games by how much it restricted your opponent going second, filling a similar role to what Trap Dust Shoe did in the past. This card only got more toxic as time passed too. The game became faster, making this even more of a blowout than it already was. The release of Pot of Prosperity gave decks even a higher chance of fighting it when going first, since many players would do their whole combo to empty the deck of their engine pieces, and then have an even higher chance of finding their order. Worst of all is that in the presence of Mystic Mind in the format, the card even had a reasonable reason to be main decked as it was a pretty good out, which made it more than a post-side worry. Now, despite being so hated and seeing such consistent play, Konami seemed unwilling to hit it all the way until early 2022 as if they couldn't admit they had made a mistake. Of all the erratas around, the one to Imperial Order is the most unfortunate one. Not because it ruined the card, but because of all the formats it made worse with its existence. Alright, and that's the video. If you happen to know of any other cards you may have missed, or have any ideas for future videos just like this one, please let us know down in the comments below.